Good morning to everybody from Germany. Um, we have now the session nine, evidence-based treatment of sepsis two. I welcome you in over 150 countries and our audience of more than 115,000 people. I'm the chair of the session. I'm Markus Weigand at Heidelberg University Hospital. We will have an interesting session on fluid, albumin, and some of the adjunctive therapies, cytokine, and endotoxin removal, vitamin C, antioxidants, and at last, andosperna uh, for primum non nocere. So the first speaker is Peter Hordrup. He's a clinician and clinical researcher with special interest in intensive care. His main topic of interest are sepsis, fluid resuscitation, and randomized clinical trials. He finished his PhD in fluid resuscitation volumes in 2016 in Copenhagen. He did a lot of uh, multi-center trials and he's coordinating investigator of classic trials. And I also want to thank our exclusive sponsor of session nine, CSL Beering. Without any of the sponsors, our World Congress of Sepsis would not be possible. So thank you very much. I now hand over to Peter. Thank you very much, Marcus. And first of all, many thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk on fluid resuscitation in sepsis. It's a great honor for me, and I think this format of a free internet-based congress is very awesome. The appropriately non-conclusive title I was given was Fluids in Sepsis, Maybe Less is More. And the question of how much fluid to give has been a burning question and a matter of intense discussion for decades, if not centuries. I want to talk a bit about when short-term effects and longer-term effects points in opposite directions. I will start with an example from the beginning of intravenous fluid therapy, and then I will propose that we might currently be doing a comparable mistake. So, first a trip back to the 1830s and the cholera pandemics. Back then, we treated these severely dehydrated patients with bloodletting, emetics, and laxatives. But the thoughts of uh, Dr. O'Shaughnessy was a paradigm changing and, and led to this young Scottish doctor called Thomas Latter to try administering different types of IV fluids to these patients. He described remarkable results, but prior to the patients doing better, the diarrhea, which have ceased due to severe dehydration, returned. So if we accept that the diarrhea was the problem and not the solution, then the administration of fluid could be viewed as resulting in an initial worsening. This was a criticism initially provided by uh, some contemporary physicians. But as we all know, the IV fluids quickly cash on due to the massive beneficial effects on a slightly longer term when gearing during these large fluid losses. Now we'll present data arguing that we might be doing a comparable mistake. There's a twist though. Um, I will argue that when we administer fluids beyond dehydration, to improve the circulation, we might see an initial beneficial effect, but might cause harm on a longer term. And just to clarify, I will argue that there is a difference in the balance between benefit and harm of fluid resuscitation between fluids giving to correct losses and fluid giving beyond this with the aim of maximizing cardiac output. The FEE trial by Maitland and colleagues is probably known by many of you, but in brief, around uh, 3,000 African children with severe infection and circulatory impairment were randomized to either an albumin bolus, a saline bolus, or no bolus. This trial was stopped early due to increased mortality at 48 hours in both bolus arms compared to the no bolus group. This was a surprise to many, uh, including the, the trial group. What I especially found interesting and worrying from this trial was a later paper exploring the mechanisms 
behind this excess mortality found in the trial. When looking at the proportion of patients with circulatory impairment, more patients in the bolus group had circulatory impairment at one hour after randomization. And this despite fewer had died at 48 hours. The cause of uh, death, by the way, was primarily due to circulatory collapse and not predominantly respiratory failure, as one might expect. So it may seem like a fluid bolus resulted in an initial circulatory improvement, but was detrimental at 48 hours with increased mortality. Byrne and uh, colleagues may have shared my concern because they recently published a very cool study in sheep, which was inspired by the results of the FEAST trial. The sheep were exposed to a, uh, an experimental model of sepsis and then either fluid resuscitated plus vasopressors or kept only on vasopressors. Again, they saw an initial but temporary circulatory improvement with increased cardiac index after fluid resuscitation. One could say that these sheep were fluid responders. Interestingly, the dose of vasopressors to maintain blood pressure steadily increased during the first 12 hours after fluid resuscitation and was significantly higher in the fluid resuscitated sheep compared to the non-fluid resuscitated sheep. So, considering adult patients with septic shock, we have indirect data and animal experimental data suggesting uh, an initial benefit but longer term harm with fluid resuscitation. But data on adults with sepsis in high resource setting, settings such as an ICU are unfortunately much more scarce. In Denmark and Finland, we did the classic feasibility trial where 150 adult patients with sepsis who had received the initial fluid resuscitation were randomized to either a liberal fluid resuscitation strategy aiming at reflecting standard care or a fluid restriction strategy where fluids were not allowed unless there were signs of hyperperfusion, including high lactate modeling and low blood pressure despite vasopressors. The protocol resulted in less resuscitation fluid given in the restrictive group compared to the liberal group. We saw a very large relative difference, but a much more modest absolute difference. We also exploratorily assessed patient important outcomes. These all favored fluid restriction, including fewer patients with worsening of acute kidney injury. Importantly, though, we did not have the power to ad adequately assess these outcomes, but I believe that it may be considered ad as an additional red flag. Now, the classic trial was a pragmatic trial and not as strictly controlled as the FEAST trial and the SHEEP study, but we also did a post hoc study assessing the hemodynamic effects within the first 24 hours. And here we did not see any signal of a sustained improvement of hemodynamic measures such as lactate, vasopressor dose, or urinary output in the liberal group compared to the restrictive group. Taken all together, there are data uh, for us as clinicians to be concerned about a disconcordance between what we initially see following fluid resuscitation and the patient's longer term outcomes, at least in sepsis. But unfortunately, we are not even close to having enough data to draw any firm conclusions. But of course, to leave on a positive note, I think that when we are looking ahead, the future is very bright. The Clovis trial with liberal crystalloids versus early vasopressors is ongoing in the U.S. We are planning to beginning enrollment in the large-scale classic trial this fall in Europe. And in the pipelines uh, are also the radar program in the UK, um, the ARISE fluids in Australia and New Zealand, and I recently also heard about the pediatric squeeze trial in Canada. So they are indeed exciting times ahead.
Many thanks for the attention, and I'm happy to discuss further also on Twitter. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much for your beautiful talk. So um, I have some questions. In the Surviving Zepsis campaign, um, there is something called like you have to give fluid as long as the patient improves. Let's say blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes down, and so on. So it's uh, targeted fluid responsiveness. But as I understand your talk, we should give only fluid when fluid is needed. But how would you um, do it in the daily practice? What are your parameters to determine um, how many fluid is needed? Yeah, thank you, Marcus. That is a very good question. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have the... I, ca I can't say that I have the right answer, but I will try to answer it anyway. Um, so for me, I think the most important thing is that the patients are not dehydrated, dehydrated, or you could call it absolute hypovolemic. That's the first. And the second is in daily practice, I think a good way to do it is to see, to assess whether we think the patient might benefit from an increased cardiac output and not see if so uh, the other way around is seeing it, if fluids, if we get fluids, does the uh, cardiac output increase? I would take it a step further, is do we need that increase in cardiac output? Mm -hmm. um, and to do that, I would say, see if there are any signs of hyperperfusion. Uh, we could do the uh, temperature on the extremities. We could see if the lactate are, is still rising. Um, that's also just some suggestions, but we need uh, to really to to investigate this further, so I can give you a better answer next time. Um, if I if I continue, do you use in your daily practice passive leg raising or some kind of invasive or less invasive monitoring, like pulse pressure variation and so on, or do you just log on? lactate, vasopressors, model extremities, as you did in the classic trial. I have used the passive leg raising test, and I, I uh, there is quite uh, good data to, to support the use of the, the passive leg raising test. I would use that rather than the pulse pressure variations because the, um, often the, uh, the prerequisites for uh, a valid measure of these are not not there in 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 the in a severely septic uh, patient okay and how do you think fluid resuscitation should be in congestive cardiac failure patients with sepsis is there a difference to to the normal patient um well yeah, yeah. And, and this is where it's get, it's getting a bit more tricky. Uh, but if we assess that the patient, that the uh, patient will need, uh, is, will, would benefit from an increased cardiac output, it is feasible to try a, either a passive leg, leg, leg raising test or a, uh, uh, a small fluid bolus to see if the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cardiac output uh, or stroke volume increases, um, but of course we are much, we are more hesitant with fluids with with these cardiac failure patients. Okay, Peter, thank you very much for your great talk and for the very interesting and fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. So, um, I would like to continue. Um, to the next talk. So hello and thank you for the introduction. Over the next 10 minutes I'm just going to walk you through the two decades of fluid resuscitation research picking out some of the key studies that help us understand why the type of fluid matters in patients with sepsis. So before I go on these are my conflicts of interest. So over the last two decades there's been a substantial amount of research comparing types of fluid 
for resuscitation. If we look at a timeline of fluid resuscitation research, we really uh, think this has started in 1998 with the Alderman Cochrane Review through to this year in 2018 with the publication of the SMART and the SALT ED trials. So, and although there's been a lot of work published, the debate over whether to use the crystalloid or colloids continues. So just quickly for those who are unsure, crystalloids are cheap solutions made of ions that pass through semi-permeable membranes and colloids are more expensive solutions made up of larger molecules suspended in a crystalloid carrier that cannot pass through intact semi-permeable membranes. So let's start with the SAFE study. So the SAFE study compared 0.9% sodium chloride to 4% albumin in just under 7,000 intensive care patients from 16 ICUs in Australia and New Zealand. And what it showed was that there was no difference between the two fluids on the primary outcome of 28-day all-cause mortality. So when we look at some of the predefined subgroups, if we look at those patients with severe sepsis, which is based on the older uh, definitions at that time, it showed a non-significant trend to reduce mortality with albumin compared to saline. So a more detailed post hoc adjusted analysis of the sepsis patients was published in Intensive Care Medicine in 2011 and it suggested that albumin administration compared with saline may have decreased the risk of death in patients with sepsis. So after SAFE, the SAFE TRIP study, so translating research into practice study, was conducted to determine what types of fluids were being used in ICUs globally. This was conducted in 391 ICUs from 25 countries and I've analysed the sepsis patients' data separately and there was just um, over 30% of uh, sepsis patients that were included in the SAFE TRIP study. Now the trend was similar to the main study with wide international variation in fluid choice and colloids were used more often than crystalloids with a colloid to crystalloid ratio of approximately 70 to 30%. The main crystalloid used was saline at 50%, followed closely by balanced salt solutions at around 40%. And for colloids, hydroxyethyl starch was used more often, but only slightly more than albumin. So moving forward to some of the key HESS research, which was published during the period 2008 to uh, 2013. So due to time, I'll only cover the BICEP, 6S and CHEST studies. So the VICEP study published in 2008 compared Ringer's lactate to an older generation HESS in just over 500 patients with severe sepsis from 18 German intensive care units. The trial was stopped early for safety reasons but found that HESS was harmful and there was a dose-dependent effect. Four years later, the 6S trial was published which compared a newer generation HESS to Ringer's acetate in just under 800 patients with severe sepsis and it was conducted in 26 ICUs in Scandinavia and they found that those patients who received HESS were more likely to die at 90 days and require renal replacement therapy compared with those that had received the Ringer's acetate. In the same year, in 2012, the CHEST study was published and this compared a newer generation HESS as well to its carrier solution saline for fluid resuscitation in 7,000 general ICU patients and it was completed in 32 ICUs in Australia and New Zealand. And although there was no difference in the 90-day mortality between the two fluids, those patients who were resuscitated with HESS received renal replacement therapy more often. Now, if we look at the chest uh, sepsis subgroup, uh, which um, was pre-specified, there was no difference um, on 90-day or cause mortality in these patients between the two uh, groups. So moving forward in um, time to 2014 with the publication of the Albios study. So this was an open-labeled randomised controlled trial which compared to the administration of 20% albumin plus crystalloid for albumin replacement or crystalloid alone in 1,800 patients with severe sepsis or septic shock from 100 ICUs in Italy. And they found that there was no difference between the two groups on the primary outcome of 28-day uh, mortality nor on the secondary outcome of 90-day or cause mortality. Now, they did do a post hoc analysis of just over 1,000 patients with septic shock 
um, com- and they compared these to the patients without septic shock and found a trend for reduced mortality with the albumin replacement group. In 2014, we repeated safe trips and we called it fluid trips and it was published in PLOS One last year. So I've uh, again pulled out those patients who had sepsis only and analysed these and you can it, the data is presented here. Um, so in 2014, there was a significant increase in the proportion of crystalloids used compared with 2007, so close to 80%. When looking at the crystalloid type, balanced solutions were used in 55% of episodes in 2014, compared with 40% in 2007. And for colloids, albumin was the dominant fluid choice in 2014 with 80% use, um, compared with in 2007 where HES was um, more common. And so perhaps showing an uptake in the evidence as um, just presented. So if we now move to the last few years between 2015 um, to this year in 2018, there's been a focus on comparing balanced salt solutions to saline as the emerging observational evidence has suggested that saline causes, causes adverse kidney injury, which is linked to the higher chloride content of saline as opposed to the lower chloride containing balanced salt solutions. So there is increasing evidence as well from cluster crossover trials that this is true, but perhaps not um, the evidence is not yet conclusive. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to briefly go through the uh, latest trial, um, which is the SMART trial, which was an open-labeled multiple uh, cluster crossover randomized control trial in five ICUs in a single hospital in the U.S., They compared the use of normal saline versus uh, balanced salt solutions, which included lactated ringers or plasmolite, and these fluids could be chosen at the clinician's discretion, and the fluids were used for fluid resuscitation in just um, 15,800 patients. The primary... Outcome was a composite of death from any cause, new renal replacement therapy or persistent renal dysfunction at 30 days. And this was called MAKE30. So what they found is uh, with the balanced crystalloids, uh, those patients who received these uh, had a significantly lower rate of major adverse kidney events compared to the saline group. The effect of MAKE30 was also examined in a number number of pre-specified subgroups. The effect was strongest in patients with sepsis, although um, when you uh, test for heterogeneity between the two groups, it fell short of uh, the traditional level of statistical significance. So in conclusion, the type of fluid does matter, and the reason that is is because it can impact on important patient outcomes. And although no one ideal fluid exists, fluid trends have followed the evidence with a move away from using colloids to an increased use of crystalloids. When colloids are used, albumin is chosen and uh, balanced salt solutions um, are now in favour as the type of fluid for resuscitation, but perhaps more evidence is needed to determine their safety and efficacy. And currently there's two uh, ongoing uh, large multi-centred blinded randomised controlled trials which will compare plasmolite 148 and saline in ICU patients. The first is the BASIC study which will recruit 11,000 ICU patients in Brazil and the other is the PLUS study which will recruit uh, 8,800 patients in Australia and New Zealand ICUs. Now, both these trials are targeting a more severely ill patient population than the SMART trial, and both have landmark mortality at 90 days as their primary outcome measure. So these trials will add important evidence to the balance versus saline debate. So thank you. Naomi, thank you very much for your great talk. So my first question is, is there a different choice for the fluid in acute pancreatitis, or is it the same as for septic shock? Uh, to tell you the truth, I, I wouldn't um, want to answer that. Just um, I'm not exactly sure uh, what the um, best fluid that's being used uh, in that uh, group of patients is. Do you think it's uh, balanced salt solutions or is it albumin? Okay. And uh, what do you use in your daily practice? And when to shift from crystal reeds or balanced crystal reeds to albumin? So how do you do it in your daily practice? 
So um, in our ICU, we're conducting the uh, PLUS study. So all patients need to be randomised to uh, that fit, uh, that receive uh, that are um, expected to receive fluid resuscitation, where uh, we have equipoise to um, to uh, randomise these patients to uh, either the um, balanced salt solution or the saline solution, um, and we believe uh, we've got. Uh, that there's um, n not definitive evidence to use one or the other, and that's why we're um, participating in that trial. Okay. And the last question is uh, use of normal saline in critical ill patient questionable. Should we avoid it? What is your personal opinion on that? I think um, the current evidence is suggesting that uh, that. Perhaps we shouldn't be using normal saline, but I would like to um, uh, see further evidence from these uh, two randomised controlled trials to provide a definitive answer. So, Naomi, thank you very much for the intensive discussion and your beautiful talk. So, we move on with human albumin and sepsis with Professor Zucker. He is Professor of Anesthesiology and Consultant in the Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care uh, at the uh, University of Jena. He studied medicine and uh, also got his master degree in intensive care at Cairo University in 2000. Then he spent two years as a research fellow in the Department of Intensive Care Erasmus Hospital with Charles-Louis Vincent. And now he is chair of the systemic inflammation and sepsis section of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and section editor of the Journal of Critical Care. Yes, sir. Um, I'm looking forward to what you told us on human albumin and sepsis. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. As you have heard uh, before, uh, the volume substitution in sepsis or in the ICU in general is a, is a never-ending debate. That's my conflict of interest. So we are running currently a study on uh, the possible beneficial effect of albumin in patients with septic shock, a multi-center randomized uh, trial in Germany. Uh, I don't have any other conflicts of uh, interest uh, concerning the subject of this presentation. In the last years, we had a lot of uh, a lot of discussions. A lot of rumor has uh, emerged in the literature about the safety of uh, colloids, especially the semi-synthetic colloids. We hear, of course, about uh, the possible uh, deleterious effects of um, synthetic colloids like uh, starches on um, the renal function and also in outcome in patients admitted to our ICUs. In addition to the well-known um, other side effects of uh, the colloids, the synthetic colloids that have been introduced in um, uh, treatment of patients in critically ill patients and patients with sepsis. This includes also not only the starches, but also uh, gelatines and other solutions. Uh, in the contrary, um, albumin is um, a natural uh, com um, uh, is a natural compound that we have in our body, which is produced in the liver, and it's the most abundant protein in human blood plasma. Uh, it provides uh, up to 70% of the normal oncotic colloid pressure. Um, that's why um, it is uh, one of the important uh, molecules that keeps the oncotic pressure uh, at uh, the desired levels uh, in our patients and in our bodies. Um, hypoalbuminemia is a um, uh, very common occurrence in our uh, ICU and uh, critically ill patients, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of indications for the administration of um, uh, albumin in patients, in critically ill patients, especially patients with sepsis. Um, the question is whether albumin by itself or human albumin being uh, given to our patients is uh, a volume resuscitation therapy or is it uh, a real drug that may exert a lot of uh, favorable actions in our patients? Um, there are a lot of evidence from experimental studies about the beneficial effects of uh, human albumin. Uh, of course, the colloid uh, oncotic pressure that is effectively expanded giving uh, albumin. But in addition to this, albumin may have also 
um, a very favorable effect on the microcirculatory flow, flow um, and it may increase uh, the mesenteric blood flow, decrease glucoside trolling, and many other effects that have been shown in experimental studies. We also improve uh, renal blood flow. It may prevent um, the decrease in car cardiomyocyte uh, contractility following sepsis, in addition to the antioxidant and the scavenger properties of abdomen that makes this molecule very um, favorable uh, or um, many, uh, um, uh, very uh, um, promising in uh, patients with uh, sepsis. Um, a lot of experimental studies have shown that even uh, when you have a decreased albumin level in your blood, that the antioxidant uh, capacity uh, in um, the blood decreases markedly. Uh, in addition to other studies that have also suggested that even um, the effect of album may be uh, some sort of differential according to the concentration of album. So human album, 20 or 25 percent may exert more anti-inflammatory and antioxidant activities compared to uh, the 5 percent um, albumin. Also in patients, in critically ill patients, a lot of uh, studies have shown that administration of uh, human albumin may influence morbidity as one study that has been done in uh, Brussels by Dubois et al. have shown that um, um, providing albumin to our critically ill patients to keep the serum levels above 30 grams uh, per liter may uh, have an influence on um, the morbidity of these patients, um, organ dysfunction, organ failure. Uh, becomes less when you have uh, your uh, human album and serum levels above 30 gram per liter. But again, every drug or every um, maneuver that we are using in our ICUs has a uh, dark side. Albumin has been also, um, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, side effects of administration of uh, human album, may, which may be deleterious in our critically ill patients too. Human albumin is a blood product, of course. Um, we have some contamination infections, pyrogens, or uh, whatever. Uh, of course, this uh, risk is very low, but still it's a blood product by then. Um, some experimental studies have shown also that um, human albumin, by administration of human albumin at large amount in patients who are uh, having some sort of cardiac dysfunction or cardiac failure, um, the hemodynamic effect of albumin may not be favorable in these patients. May lead also to salt and water retention, hypernatremia, and some experimental studies have even uh, shown that it may decrease myocardial contractility by binding uh, of ionized calcium. Uh, some uh, experimental studies have suggested also that albumin may have an, uh, some sort of an immunosuppressive effect. There is also, um, as I said, uh, dark sides of albumin. And even if when you are giving albumin to uh, expand your uh, intravascular volume, it's uh, very important to uh, to understand that in uh, some disease populations like patients with sepsis, um, uh, which is, um, um, uh, which is um, a disease that uh, may impair also the microcirculation with some sort of, uh, of microvascular effects, and separation of the tight junctions at the microvascular uh, level. This may lead even to the extra, the, to the extravasation of uh, albumin in the interstitium. So if you think that you are giving albumin to maintain intravascular volume, um, you uh, may not be really, really right about this because albumin may exudate to the extravascular space and even lead to uh, an increase in tissue edema in uh, patients uh, with sepsis. Um, album administration has um, um, very um, uh, um, very peculiar um, uh, history in patients, in critically ill patients. Uh, this meta-analysis um, of randomized trials that have been uh, published by um, um, by uh, Wilkins and uh, Navicus uh, in 2001 have raised a lot of rumor about uh, the use of album in critically ill patients showing that administration of uh, human albumin may be associated with higher risk of death. Other subsequent meta-analyses uh, have shown that uh, these effects may disappear if you include more uh, studies, and human album may even have some sort of uh, beneficial effects given to critically ill patients 
in terms of improving mortality, uh, morbidity in these patients, uh, such as this uh, meta-analysis by uh, the group of John Louise and Tom. Um, uh, the SAFE study was a landmark in um, the history of administration of albumin to our critically ill patients. It was uh, the first large randomized trial um, that um, have randomized patients to receive uh, albumin 4% uh, versus normal saline for 28 days. Um, this study has been performed in patients, critically ill patients, in need of uh, volume uh, replacement therapy. As you know, this study has shown that um, uh, albumin may be safe in these patients, so we don't have a really, really a difference in uh, mortality among patients, whether they receive human albumin or saline. Uh, but this study has shown very interesting results, uh, which um, are that albumin may have some differential effects uh, according to um, the type of patients or uh, the type of disease um, that we are um, using albumin for. So uh, in this study, um, um, it has been shown that uh, albumin may be of uh, a beneficial effect if given in patients with uh, severe sepsis. And in some uh, subsets or subgroups of critically ill patients may be even associated with a deleterious effect. Uh, like patients um, uh, admitted to the ICU after traumatic brain uh, brain injury. Um, so, um, according to the subgroup analysis of uh, the SAFE study, uh, another um, very large randomized control trial has been um, uh, funded and performed in Italy, the ALBUS study. And this study actually included patients with sepsis, whether due to um, septic shock, severe sepsis, or um, sepsis without, um, without organ dysfunction or failure. Indeed, this study didn't show um, uh, differences uh, in mortalities in the two study arms if the patients are given albumin or crystalloid. But importantly, giving albumin uh, have been associated with a favorable outcome uh, in the subset of group uh, of, of, of ICU uh, patients who had septic shock in uh, this study. So albumin may be beneficial if given to the most severe patients who are in need for um, this sort of anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and um, beneficial effects uh, of uh, human uh, albumin. Uh, so uh, by the end is the big concern of albumin administration or regarding concerning albumin administration is uh, about the risk and uh, the benefits. Uh, human albumin is uh, a drug, is a medication that has uh, also some risk. And if uh, the risk-benefit uh, ratio uh, increase in favor of uh, of uh, albumin administration, um, uh, that means that albumin may be beneficial in these patients, and that may explain why albumin or human albumin is beneficial in patients with septic shock, where the benefits are uh, far more than the expected risks of the drug. So I would conclude that um, human albumin is safe for use as a volume replacement therapy in critically ill patients, except patients, of course, with uh, traumatic brain injury. And um, I would also uh, say that the indication for colloid administration is the main concern rather than the type of colloid itself. As I mentioned in my last uh, slide, it's all about uh, the risk-benefit ratio of, um, of uh, the solution that you are using in your patients. Um, the current evidence does not justify the routine use of the human albumin, of course. However, the therapeutic use of human albumin in patients with septic shock may be beneficial, pending the results of uh, the ongoing trials, including the trial, the trial that we are now uh, performing in Yemen. Thank you. Thank you, Yata, for this very interesting talk on albumin. When should Albumin use in septic shock, according to your opinion, is there a threshold or is it a lot of fluid? And when when is the indication for that? Well, the the evidence uh, or um, um, uh, about this is more or less speculative at this moment uh, because it's based basically on the results of the Albus trials, uh, the Albus uh, Albus trial, which has shown that uh, the administration of albumin in the late phase, not in the early phase of septic shock, uh, may be uh, more beneficial than administrating it in the early phase of septic shock. So you give it basically as a as a medication, as a drug, not as a volume replacement therapy. 
it doesn't work when you give it very early. So it's uh, a solution that expands uh, the intravascular volume, that's right. But that's not actually the reason why albumin may uh, lead to a decrease um, uh, or, or uh, a better outcome in these patients. Uh, the protocol of the ALGO study was that to give albumin in the ICU until 28 days after uh, the um, onset of septic shock. So that means that it's not only about giving one dosage of albumin or two dosage, it's about maintaining um, the serum levels over large or a long period of time above uh, the threshold of 30 <coughs> gram per deciliter, which has been suggested in the Albius study, and before that also in the pilot study done uh, by Dubai et al. Yeah, so, so you think we should not use it as a fluid therapy with 5% of albumin? Instead, we should use it as a targeted therapy to increase albumin concentration with a 20% solution and the dosage to have albumin more than 30. Well, yes and no, because, uh, well, we have to differentiate between the two indications at first. Albumin is a very good uh, colloid, and uh, compared with the safety of other synthetic colloids, it's actually uh, the drug which is associated with the, with the best um, uh, um, benefit risk uh, profile, but the problem with albumin, as you know, is the is the cost of albumin. So if um, you are using uh, albumin on it, it doesn't cost a lot. Uh, you can use it also as a volume uh, expansion therapy. Uh, there is no uh, nothing that uh, that contraindicates this sort of uh, of indication for the use of five percent albumin. So you can use it as a volume expansion therapy, and you can use it also as a as a drug to maintain the levels above 30 to have the anti-inflammatory effect. So uh, you can use it, but um, the problem is again about the, uh, the cost of albumin, which is very high. Yeah, okay. And uh, you know, as you know, in Germany, uh, a lot of people say we should use gelatines. Can you comment on that? Well, I think that we have enough evidence also. It's not really based on a very large randomized controlled trials, but we have a lot of retrospective trials that have shown that uh, the safety profile of gelatin has not also been uh, studied adequately. So we don't have really, um, all the focus was on starship, but if you look at uh, a lot of, uh, of post hoc meta-analyses of, uh, of large trials, like um, the meta-analysis on uh, like the analysis from the uh, from the SOAP study that have been done 20 years ago, and some of the uh, data from our institution also in Vienna that shows that gelatin may be uh, may be also uh, associated with uh, a very deleterious effect in critically ill patients, just just like the starship. It has also a very bad effect on the renal function, and it may also influence outcome in uh, in ICU patients. Uh, it's not based on randomized trials, this evidence, but we don't have uh, this sort of, of trials that justify the use and the safety of uh, gelatin. I, I don't know if you are aware of any, but uh, we don't have simply uh, this sort of large trials in gelatin. Okay. And uh, the, the last question, you said that yeah. albumin improves cardiac contractility. Then on a, as a side effect, it may worsen cardiac contractility. Um, why is there this discrepancy? Is it because of your nice calcium or what is the reason? Yeah, for, uh, well, one effect, which is a deleterious effect, is by uh, chelating the, the calcium. So that's the deleterious effect. But on the other side, um, um, the human album itself may have a direct effect uh, on the uh, cardiac myocytes and improve uh, contractility through this effect. So again, uh, this uh, sort of the net effect of on uh, of the human album administration on the uh, cardiac um, function cannot be uh, determined, um, of course, for sure, because it's a, it's a colloid that increases also the preload, and um, it can increase the cardiac output through this effect. It can affect uh, the, my, the, my, um, uh, uh, the cardiac myocytes directly, um, whether negatively or positively, and the end effect was it will be some sort of a cumulative effect of all these effects together. Yeah. And uh, the last question, is there a difference for albumin in gram-positive or gram-negative sepsis because you said that albumin is binding LPS? Uh, well, we don't have a, a large evidence about, um, about that. 
That may be true, but uh, again, every disease situation in patients with infection and sepsis is uh, is uh, some sort of uh, a unique uh, situation for uh, gram-negative infections and uh, abdominal infections, for example. This is some sort of a, a more severe forms of infection that are associated also with uh, sometimes surgical uh, surgical sepsis. And in this case, also you you can't uh, you can't know exactly why. Uh, the drug works in in one patient and not in the other because uh, the inf- the outcome is um, is confounded by a lot of factors, a lot of other factors. Yeah, no, thank you very much for uh, sharing this interesting data with us, and we will see how the field continues. Now, the next speaker, Sean Myberg, is already here, so we will now. Um, uh, yeah, we will have the talk on uh, Professor Pai later. So I want to introduce John Myberg from Australia. He now will talk on vitamin C and antioxidants. Professor Myberg is a uh, professor of intensive care medicine at the University of New South Wales. He is director of the Division of Critical Care and Trauma at the George Institute for Global Health. He's also a practicing intensive care physician for more than 35 years. He has conducted a lot of clinical trials. Uh, he's a founding member of the Andes Clinical Trials Group. So we are very anxious what he will talk on vitamin C and antioxidants. So um, I have to apologize. Uh, Professor Mayberg is not uh, presenting online. So his talk is pre-recorded. So it's not possible to have uh, questions for him. Um, so let's start this Professor Mayberg's uh, talk. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I'm pleased to give this presentation about the role of vitamin C and antioxidants as a potential therapy for the treatment of sepsis in patients in the ICU. Vitamin C deficiency, or scurvy, is as old as humanity. It was recognized and defined by, by Hippocrates and recorded by the ancient Egyptians in their tombs. The curative effect of citrus fruit in treating sailors uh, with scurvy was recognized at the turn of the 16th century during the age of discovery between 16, 1500 and 1800. The British naval maritime physician, James Lind, was the first to document these associations and the associations and improvements with citrus fruit and began a series of experiments and strategies to implement, implement the routine supplementation of fruit in the British naval workforce. It is interesting to note that more sailors died of scurvy than died during combat during this era. The ultimate translation of, of these observations into practice uh, is documented by the reduction in number of scurvy cases over time is shown on the slide where it took some 50 years before scurvy rates were substantially reduced and resulted in a variety you know, of strategies including uh, hospital-based therapies, um, early recognition and dietary supplementation. So whilst the lime or fruit may have been regarded as a magic bullet, there were clearly other strategies at play to produce this substantial reduction in uh, scurvy rates. Uh, Thomas Addison was an English physician based at Guy's Hospital and recognised as a superb diagnostician. He was the first person to, to report or demonstrate the association between acute adrenal failure and the syndromes of cardiovascular collapse or Addisonian crisis. Uh, it took some time for these as associations to become uh, standard, standardized um, as to whether they were causative or actually, or actually uh, 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 as an association. Um, but uh, the advent of adrenal insufficiency has been attributed to Dr. Anderson back in the 18th century. Dr. Christian Eichmann was a Dutch physician who spent most of his 
his his scientific uh, life working in the Dutch East Indies, where he uh, reported the association between dietary deficiencies, particularly the lack of anti-neurotic vitamins, vitamin B, and the development of neurological or hemodynamic beriberi, dry or wet, in these populations of patients with poor diets. He also implemented the use of uh, unpolished rice as a supplemental agent and substantially reduced the incidence of beriberi in his community. And together with Dr. Frederick Hopkin, was awarded the Nobel Prize for vitamins. So it is clear that vitamins uh, and their role as important homeostatic cofactors has been established and their role in maintaining homeostasis in conjunction with other neuroendocrine responses, including the catecholamines, the corticosteroids, and other cofactors across all the cellular mechanisms, and particularly those involved in neuroendocrine responses based through the adrenal axis remain important. And this association is now well recognized. So it therefore follows that uh, reductions in these important cofactors may be associated with or result in uh, poor organ function in patients with uh, severe conditions such as sepsis. However, sepsis is not a simple process and its pathogenesis and its, and its, and its complexity have been reported over the years. Uh, there is a complex interaction between pro and anti-inflammatory responses, host factors and pathogen factors, all of which affect multiple organ systems through various neuroendocrine and cellular mechanisms. And whilst the vitamins and the antioxidants may have a role in these processes, uh, these processes are part of a complex soup and therefore it is probably unlikely that uh, one single agent would make a substantial difference to the complexity of the syndrome. This of course has been mirrored by the progressive lack of positive trials looking at single interventions for the treatment of sepsis, whether they be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory uh, mediators, or uh, broader therapies such as corticosteroids, antibiotic protein C, or immunoglobulin. The overall effect of these trials produced either strictly positive false positives, uh, almost certainly a type 1 error, or the larger clinical trials produce trials with the indeterminate treatment effect when looking at mortality. So whilst there may be important subgroups or important uh, process measures that are important, it would appear that a single therapy is not effective in lowering mortality in these ICU patients. And it would follow, therefore, that protein C, that uh, vitamin C wouldn't be much different. Nevertheless, the remarkable scurvy story uh, has resulted in a reassessment of the role of vitamin C and thiamine and hydrocortisone in sepsis, given its, it, their, their ubiquitous roles and the striking effects seen in patients who in fact were vitamin C or B deficient. Is there a role for these in, in, for supplementation in our patients? Well, it will be dependent upon whether or not we can report or define whether our patients are in fact hypoascorbic. This observational study of three uh, cohorts of eight patients received either placebo, low or high doses of ascorbic acid on the left, and there was an increase in uh, vitamin C levels uh, well above baseline uh, and well past normal levels in patients who received the different doses in a dose-dependent dose fashion. Of interest, the the baseline uh, serum vitamin C level was in fact subnormal, uh, well below the normal level of 50 to 70 micromoles per litre. And this may in fact be a normal variant or normal response to illness, or it may be that these patients were in fact actually deficient. This is a big unknown question about interpreting these results. It also appeared from the small study that there was an improvement in organ failure scores in patients who received the low and high doses of ascorbic acid. But this is clearly um, uh, association and not causation in a very small clinical trial. Similarly, is there a role with hypothiaminia? This is another small study, uh, randomized controlled trial comparing thiamine to placebo in lactate expression and in patients who were deemed, who were seen to be thiamine deficient, 
uh, 28 patients out of 88, uh, these patients had a higher rate of survival compared to patients who in fact were thiamine deficient. Uh, and this was associated with an improvement in survival in those thiamine deficient patients who received thiamine. Again, very small study, but an interesting observation and perhaps would help inform the design of a clinical trial. Well, has the trial been conducted thus far? Well, the answer is no, it hasn't, but the Merrick Cocktail Study, or the study conducted by Dr. Paul Merrick in Norfolk uh, two years ago, has generated a great deal of discussion and a great deal of emotion uh, in, in some uh, quarters, all of which is a very positive contribution to the discussion. These patients in a before and after trial received a cocktail of infusions of vitamin C, hydrocortisone and thiamine in replacement doses, not in suppressive doses, and uh, the effects on a pre and post study were quite striking. Um, the patients who were in the control group in the preceding phase of 47 patients had a significantly higher mortality, close to that predicted, than patients who received the actual cocktail. Uh, 47 patients in both groups. This is an enormous reduction in effect size, um, and uh, this has been held, held as a highly positive result. Of interest that there was also an association in the reduction in or adrenaline dose uh, around two hours in patients who received the cocktail compared to those who did not. Uh, this study was a single center study, unblinded, non-randomized trial with a high degree of selection bias and outcome reporting bias. So whilst these, these findings are very striking, they must be interpreted with a very high degree of caution uh, as it is unlikely that this is a true positive effect. Nevertheless, there is a emerging biological basis for these results as discussed earlier. Ascorbic acid is a key cofactor in many of the key uh, cycles. Uh, it is important in maintaining endothelial barrier function and may ameliorate uh, endothelial barrier dysfunction in association with other antioxidants by uh, um, reducing the adverse effects of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the potential interaction with hydrocortisone, thiamine, and corticosteroids may in fact be a role in improving these functions. So it would appear that the, the features seen here have some biological plausibility based on current Importantly, the reduction in catecholamines is consistent with that observed in the high-quality blinded steroids trials, uh, which reported that uh, patients who received uh, blinded infusions of hydrocortisone had a significant uh, uh, improvement in catecholamine responsiveness as defined as a reduction in vasopressors, as was seen uh, in the um, Merrick study. And this is, a, this is a, an effect that is well, known, well recognized in association with hydrocortisone. And it is plausible that uh, thiamine and or vitamin C may have had an additive effect in this important hemodynamic effect. So does this mean that we should adopt Dr. Merrick or Dr. Ehrlich's magic bullet, uh, the cocktail of hydrocortisone, thiamine and uh, vitamin C? as a therapy, one for all our patients with septic shock. Well, two schools of thought are quite different. The protagonist that we should embrace this would argue that there is a strong historical rationale based on the remarkable scurvy story. There appears to be a biologically plausible effect through basic science that continues to emerge. And uh, there is a, a likelihood that this may in fact have some benefit. That the thesis is based on the predication that neuroendocrine dysfunction is central to host failure and host death. An augmentation of these deficient um, uh, molecules may in fact improve neuroendocrine function. They cite the evidence published to date, in particular the, the small studies as compelling, with the effect size strong enough to uh, change clinical practice. And in fact, in some jurisdictions where this has been rolled out, has become a part of practice in these institutions. They also argue that the intervention uh, is cheap and ubiquitous and well established in clinical practice and there will appear to be no major barriers to clinical uptake of the use of vitamin C or hydrocortisone in thiam or thiamine in clinical practice. Moreover, there appears to be no evidence of harm and therefore patients aren't subject to any adverse effects 
in association with this particular cocktail. And finally, some protagonists have argued that it would be unethical to deny patients this therapy based on current evidence and that a trial is not indicated or needed. The alternative view is, is, slightly, is slightly different. This is based on the fact that the physiology of sepsis is an evolving science and it's complex and that our understandings now will change and that further elucidation of individual responses and genomics uh, may allow us to target patients in a more direct and safer fashion rather than a one-stop shop for all patients. There's also evidence more compelling than the opposite that neuroendocrine manipulation in adverse pa is, is adverse in ICU patients, citing the experience of tight glycemic control and growth hormone, and that supplementation of drugs to normalise numbers doesn't necessarily convey improvements in patient centred outcomes. There is no high quality evidence to date based on the principles of high quality science that mitigate bias uh, through randomisation uh, and blinding. And until these are done, we have to be very careful about adopting uh, too good to believe uh, results from clinical trials. Importantly, the short term costs do not translate or equate to improved cost effectiveness. Uh, this is an important metric when looking at the actual costs or savings of an intervention. And more importantly, the way patients feel, function and survive are those that, important, that, are those that determine safety and efficacy of intervention. Uh, it is the view of, of antagonists, therefore, mine included, that by not doing a high quality trial is unethical until we get the definitive answer. It is clear that this is a complex system, that there are wide ranges in time-based factors, patient-based factors, immune responses uh, and inflammatory responses. It is unlikely that one magic bullet will be able to uh, substantially affect the trajectory of patients across the spectrum, particularly when the majority of patients uh, um, die uh, later on in sepsis and not during the acute phase. It's also encouraging to note that there are emerging trials coming from Australia, United States and Slovenia. These are all smallish trials, phase 2B and phase 3 trials, the results of which we hope will inform the design of high quality clinical trials to address an emerging and important clinical question that ultimately will inform clinical practice, create knowledge and hopefully improve the survival of our patients. Thank you for listening. So, um, thank you very much for Professor Myberg on vitamin D and antioxidants. So, as I already said, the top was pre-recorded and we really apologize that we ta can't take questions at the moment. But I saw some questions popping up, what he feels about the uh, um, findings of Americas. I understood his talk now. It should be, it's very interesting, but we should be very cautious to put it now in the clinical routine until we have uh, much more data. So we continue with uh, Professor Perna's talk, Primum non nocere, first do no harm in patients with sepsis. Professor Perna is very well known. He is a senior staff specialist and professor in intensive care at the University of Copenhagen and the Charles Institute in Sydney. His main focus is on clinical research in critical ill patients, and he did a lot of landmark trials, such as the 6S and the TRIS trial. So, Professor. Kerner, uh, we are very happy to take your talk now. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, I was um, given the challenge saying uh, title, uh, Primum non nocera in sepsis or first um, do no harm. Um, I'm very pleased and honored to be invited, and I, I think overall uh, this is a, a, an extremely well done con conference. So thank you for that. Um, I have a few conflicts of interest. Some are commercial, and two important ones are that, that I'm a guideline committee member of the SSRI, Circulatory Failure Group, and the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Group. Um, the points that I will cover um, is that I, I think our culture uh, in critical care and sepsis care uh, facilitates over-diagnosis and over-treatment. Um, 
I think it's fair to say that we have harmed patients and we likely continue to do so. And in my opinion, the solution includes embracing the uh, uncertainties, simplifying care, and do as many high quality clinical trials um, as possible. So the the term uh, premium non nocera or first to no harm uh, is referred back to uh, Hippocrates' uh, oath. Actually, he he didn't wrote those um, exact words, but something different uh, or something similar. Um, several later uh, influential uh, persons uh, in healthcare have sort of framed. Uh, the same here, a quote from um, Florence Nightingale, uh, and also outside the, the medical field, this uh, notion of uh, first to no harm uh, has been raised here, a quote from uh, the American author Kurt Vonnegut. Um, going back to, to critical care, it's being said that the polio epidemic in Copen here in Copenhagen in '52 was the birthplace of uh, critical care um, and, and intensive care in general. As you see in the picture, it, it started out pretty simple. Um, I think it's fair to say that this simplicity has been lost. Um, we now give. A lot of interventions, as illustrated on uh, on this photo, we monitor patients uh, constantly, as seen on the monitoring screen. In addition, we take multiple blood, blood sampling um, every day, uh, and thereby de facto creating a screening um, situation. Uh, so things are much different. Going back again, the birth also built a very strong um, physiological rationale for what we did. So polio caused uh, respiratory failure, increased carbon dioxide levels, ventilation, uh, improved vent ventilation, uh, positive pressure ventilation, improved uh, carbon dioxide and uh, improved outcome. Building I think something that we still carry on a strong physiological narrative from what we did. So looking at a sort of a complex picture of critical care context today, um, inside the circle there, we have our physiological rationing. We do constant screening by the monitors of the blood sampling. Uh, we measure our immediate successes using surrogate markers. Overall, we probably have poor evidence base. In spite of that, we give multiple interventions. Um, and overall, I, I think uh, in many places there is a cultural pressure to do something. It, it may often be, be more difficult to stand back and, and wait. In addition, guideline groups uh, within our society um, has a sense of wanting to guide uh, us, and therefore they produce guidance in spite of um, limited evidence. Uh, from the outside, uh, there's also pressure. Overall, society expects us to do something. Uh, in the Western world, at least, we're built on a model of growth and and a heavy role played by industry. And, and I think it's fair to say also that there is a, a sort of naive um, neophilia where anything new and fancy is seen as a, a positive uh, development and should be tried. Um, so those factors, uh, there are probably more, I think, uh, contribute to overdiagnosis and overtreatment um, in critical care. And I'll, I'll exemplify it uh, in a bit more detail using the, uh, the latest update of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guideline. Whether you like this document or not, uh, it gives an overview of the current um, evidence of care in sepsis. So there are 
a bit more than 90 statements overall, so that being recommendations or suggestions for interventions or diagnostics. Uh, and the vast majority of them are built on either low, very low, or absolutely no um, evidence. Um, going into core chapters in in the guideline, um, the numbers are um, scaring regarding the uh, level of low quality evidence recommendations. Here you see uh, what I think most of us would regard as uh, key um, interventions and diagnostics for sepsis management, and the vast majority of the recommendations are based on low quality evidence. If you're a positive thinking person, you would say that for vasoactives, only half um, are based on low quality evidence. The rest, the rest, the majority are. So I think this exemplifies uh, the guideline groups um, wish to guide us in spite of low quality evidence. Uh, the latest guideline was um, published together with a user's guide. So I think further showing this need for part of the guideline group to to help us. And, and I think done in, in the best of spirits, they provide further guidance. And here in the middle, you will see, for instance, that we should consider to intubate and mechanically ventilate patients to facilitate the infusion of the fixed volume fluid recommendation in spite of the latter being based on very low evidence. So in sort of the attempt to guide us, they suggest us to do a clearly uh, risky, potentially harmful interventions, intubation and mechanical ventilation in order to provide uh, fluid which is based on low quality evidence. The original bundles uh, is uh, an example of the same. Uh, so you may know that the surviving sepsis campaign uses bundles to ease implementation uh, of the guideline. And this is the six hour sepsis shock bundle of the 2004 um, guideline. Three bundles to be fulfilled within six hours, but two of them had to be dropped in subsequent guidelines and bundles because uh, the emerging of new data from pragmatic trials show no effect um, of these interventions. The same for the original 24-hour bundle. Three of four bundles had to be dropped, and the one highlighted there, glucose control maintenance um, for strict control, potentially have, have even harmed um, patients because the nice sugar trial showed harm from uh, strict blood, uh, blood glucose control. An overall theme appears to be that many pragmatic trials show overall no effect between intervention and comparative groups. Um, and a logical follow to that is that much of what we do may not benefit most um, patients. And therefore, simplification of care uh, has rationale. Uh, to simplify care, do less. We will um, reduce drug adverse events and interaction and med medical errors. Uh, and this will be important because we, we have difficulties in, in realizing these in clinical practice. We will lead, ease the uh, education of staff. Uh, and as an organization, overall, do better because we do less, but probably get better educating in, in doing those interventions that, that we then do. Uh, going back to the theme of harm, a recent systematic review showed that in critical care, 15 trials have shown uh, effect on survival. Um, but half of these interventions, and some of them used in clinical practice, reduced survival. Uh, so if a trial shows effect, it's like tossing a coin, whether it's, it will be harmful or um, beneficial. 
and that this may matter uh, is exemplified by the uh, success trial results in which trial the number of needed to harm uh, was 13, meaning that for every 13 patients treated with starch in the success trial, one died because of starch. Translating this into numbers of survivors, uh, we have estimated that by doing the success trial, we have produced uh, a bit less than 2,000 more sepsis survivors in Denmark. And if you just multiply up to the European Union population, um, this number may be very, very high. Um, so the risk of harm is uh, imminent. Um, therefore, to repeat my points, I think we should in embrace the uncertainties. If we don't do that, we will not improve. I think there's a rationale to simplify care. Um, and in general, it appears that that the improvements in sepsis care come through um, publicly funded collaborative academic trials, and we should do so many, as many trials um, as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Anna, for this very exciting talk. So how do we know over concern and over treatment? Because we saw a lot of in the recent years, it's with, uh, today tasked on fluid, so giving fluid as long as the patient is responsive. You have done the studies on hydroxyacid starch. We probably did over sedation. We did intensive insulin therapy with hypoglycemia. And now in the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines of combination antibiotic therapy is proposed. When do we know there is over-treatment and over-concern? Yeah, I, I, it's really difficult because the, the concern is most often confirmed after the conduct of a large trial. Uh, but I, I think empirically, uh, we may have learned that, that most interventions um, may not be beneficial or at least finally benefit the patient as most of the trials we have done show no effect uh, on patient important outcome measures. Uh, so so the, maybe the new normal should be that, that, that the, the starting point is that what we do may not benefit patient unless it has been shown um, in a trial. Okay. And um, sometimes uh, pressure from families and patients is very high to do everything as possible. How to explain that we do less to not harm the patient? Yeah, that's very difficult. It's It's not only, I think, patients and relatives, uh, it's society in general, um, it's uh, hospital systems, hospital managers, our colleagues, um, nurses. Um, so, so, so I think embracing the uncertainty would be my best uh, solution for that. So, so start to educate society, uh, hospital managers, um, colleagues, nurses, and finally, um, be more frank to, to uh, patients and relatives about our uh, uncertainties and, and elucidate to the uh, obvious harm of uh, giving multiple interventions at the same time. Uh, known side effects for many of the things that we do. We know the side effects. They are registered side effects of the drugs. Uh, obvious complications to invasive interventions and procedures um, so that the discussion includes these elements um, as well as the potential benefit. Okay, Anna, thank you very much for your great talk. So um, I would like to continue um, to the next talk. Uh, yeah, we will have the talk on Professor Pyle. Uh, we are very happy to take your talk now. 
Good morning to everybody and first of all uh, thank you for organizers of this World Sepsis Congress to uh, give me the honor and the opportunity to discuss the current evidence for cytokines or mediators and the toxin removal in severe sepsis or septic shock. Uh, we will focus the stoke on essentially the human studies and when there are there were available the randomized clinical trials which have been published yet which is well admitted is the inflammation created by the presence of abnormal bacteria in different organ or tissues of blood uh, are the starter of mediator release essentially cytokines and cells activity among the factors which are well known and recognized and demonstrated to to start the inflammatory response the the endotoxin and the lipopolysaccharide uh, are a major component of this and as a consequence this lps could be uh, the the target of the system to uh, purify the blood several system uh, or cartridges exist on the market which are uh, able to uh, trap or remove from the blood the activated cells or removing under toxin or changing the plasma cytokines by adsorption but it's important to show that there is an in, a relation between the intensity of inflammation and the intensity of organ dysfunction and we have tested this for acute kidney injury and the question was is there any relation between the severity of acute kidney injury and the intensity of inflammation and how to characterize it first of all it's interesting to see uh, that if you look at the uh, day zero day one day two after admission uh, the patients having no in open cycles or moderate in gray or severe in black acute kidney injury uh, the impact of uh, uh, this uh, kidney injury on different parameters here for the highest leukocyte count or the monocytes circulating monocytes HLAD or expression there were no differences between the subgroups of patients according to their acute kidney injury uh, if we look at the mediators cytokines IL-6 known as a pro-inflammatory molecule or IL-10 or MIF we found clearly statistically at least that there was a clear relation between the intensity of uh, inflammatory response uh, uh, and the intensity of acute kidney injury so the question might be is it possible to change this mediator level in order to reduce the organ failure? Of course, the first which was tested concerned the continuous hemofiltration method, uh, which were indicated for acute kidney injury patients uh, necessitating a renal support therapy. And in addition to this, some membranes may have some selective effect on different parameters or mediators in the blood and adding some kind of blood purification to the uh, uh, efficient renal support and the dose of this uh, continuous immunofiltration has to be sufficient and this has been uh, shown nicely in uh, 2000 by the group of Dr. Ronco testing three doses of filtration rate and clearly there was a benefit in ICU patients to use uh, uh, filtra an ultrafiltration rate around 35 ml per kilo per hour compared to the 20 
which was able to improve the survival rate. We performed in 2009 a randomized clinical trial testing the continuous venovenous hemofiltration organ failure when it is applied very early in the course of severe sepsis. Uh, as you can see here, there is a nice correlation between the plasma level and the ultrafiltrate level in a picogram per ml for different cytokines, here IL-6, MCP-1, and IL-1 array. Clearly, we can remove by the hemofiltration uh, these cytokines. But if you consider the whole blood, and not only uh, the partial uh, uh, measurement, you see that there was no benefit to use hemofiltration if you uh, target the changes in whole blood concentration of IL-6, MCP-1, and IL-1 array. So finally, the system may remove uh, some part of cytokines release, but not sufficiently enough to change the whole blood concentration. In terms of outcome, it's interesting to note in this trial that the time for worsening the SOFA was faster in the group treated with hemofiltration compared to the conventional one. You deteriorate more rapidly your uh, organs when you apply the hemofiltration. And looking at the uh, time to improve the organ dysfunction, which was marked by the, the reduction in ventilation or ventilatory support and the use of catecholamines, interestingly, the conventional group was weaned from the ventilator or the cardiovascular support more rapidly than the people having the early hemofiltration. And interestingly also, there was a higher rate of acute kidney injury or acute renal failure in the group treated with hemofiltration, necessitating more frequently the renal replacement, uh, renal replacement therapy, which was also significant. So finally, at the end of this trial, we concluded the daily use of a continuous hemofiltration in severe sepsis can it be recommended to reduce organ failure or to improve the mortality? So the question might be, is it related to uh, the dose of hemofiltration? And this has been nicely uh, investigated in acute kidney injury patients with severe sepsis or septic shock. Uh, in the EVOR study reported by Dr. Joannes Boyot, and they found in this uh, study testing the high volume, 70 ml per kilo per hour, versus the standard volume, 35 ml per kilo per hour, there was no change in 28 day mortality, and they did not improve the hemodynamic organ dysfunction. So they concluded that uh, after this trial, that high volume hemofiltration cannot be recommended for treatment of septic shock complicated by acute kidney injury. So uh, the global method doesn't work well until now, so maybe some more specific uh, device or membrane might be useful, and this has been uh, based, of, first of all, on the LPS removal. And since the LPS coming from the gram-negative bacteria can be elevated in the blood by different mechanisms, could be the gut translocation or uh, direct infections in the lung. Uh, interestingly, the LPS can be perhaps a, a target for the device to be removed and improve the outcome. Which is well known that if you inject small amount of LPS in healthy volunteers, this is creating a sepsis-like syndrome. Unfortunately, until recently, we did not have a quantitative measurement of LPS to show the relation between the level of LPS and the intensity of inflammatory response and potentially the outcome. But logically, LPS removal might be positive in terms of outcome. And this was tested in Japan for many years now. And it's a routine uh, and classic treatment for patients with septic shock 
to be hemoperfused with the polymyxin B cartridges, which has the property to remove the endotoxin from plasma, as you can see here on this in vitro system. And the first uh, youth, uh, trial, uh, randomized clinical trial reported was published in 2009 in a JAMA by Dr. Cruz from Italy. And this time they tested in 64 patients the benefit to use polymyxin B six hours after the surgery for peritonitis. And the, sec the primary endpoint was the change in hemodynamic stability. And what they found uh, is an improvement in hemodynamic stability, which was significantly improved by the hemoperfusion. And surprisingly, they have a survival time, which was longer in the uh, hemoperfused group, which uh, leads the committee to recommend to stop the trial. But as mentioned in the comment made by Professor Vincent in JAMA, this uh, membrane was able to prolong the time before mortality occurred, but the rate of mortality at 28 days were, was similar between the two arms. So in 2015, we reported uh, the trial we performed called Abdomix Trials in Intensive Care Medicine enrolling 232 patients with the primary endpoint of mortality at day 28 and as a secondary endpoint of mortality at day 90 in the SOFA score evolution. The patients enrolled uh, should have a septic shock related to an acute peritonitis and uh, we tested also the adequacy of surgical procedure to be sure that there is no confounding factor. And the results were quite disappointing. At day 28, the mortality rate was similar between the two groups as it was at day 90. And we failed to find any evolution, beneficial evolution uh, for the SOFA score from day zero to day seven uh, in between the two arms. So the second question in this trial was to test the potential uh, benefit to reduce the cytokines level in these patients. Uh, measuring uh, uh, different cytokines, we observed that most of them were able to reduce, to decrease a long time as it is expected. But this reduction a long time was similar between the two groups and there was no impact of the uh, hemoperfusion technique for that. The only one cytokine which was potentially interesting to note was the IL-17 which is known to be a cytokine having protective role in the host defense against pathogen and this was unfortunately reduced significantly more in polymyxin B group compared to the control. So at the end of the day, we, we concluded that the polymyxin B in this trial at least was not able to influence the plasma cytokine level. The third impact on, was on the LPS level. So we decided after the critiques on the uh, later sent to the journal, we decided to measure quantitatively the LPS level, which was uh, Perform in collaboration with Dr. Lagro, uh, measuring with a mass spectrometry the real quantitative level of LPS. Globally, in the whole coral, the level was around 38 picomol per ml. The normal value was estimated to be lower than 12. And finally, we did not find any impact of the polymyxin B treatment on the plasma level of, of LPS a long time. The recent, uh, recently published Euphrates trial started in 2010 in the uh, October issue of uh, the JAMA Journal uh, reported the uh, uh, impact of polymyxin B applied to 450 septic shock patients having a high level of uh, LPS activity and uh, using the similar uh, endpoint that we used, they found no significant difference in mortality at day 28 
and even uh, on the patients having the the most important severity such as the patients with a SOFAS score over nine and they concluded that among the patients with septic shock and high on the toxin activity the polymyxin B hemoperfusion treatment uh, did not reduce the mortality at day 28. So some uh, some meta-analysis uh, were asking uh, different questions and having different criteria for selecting the studies. The first one, which was the more stringent, group six trials and found insufficient evidence to support the routine use of polymyxin B to treat patients with sepsis or septic shock. And the other one having a less stringent criteria for selecting the studies found that may reduce the mortality in patients in specific disease severity subgroups. So let's move to the uh, future and the uh, potential interest of other techniques such as cytosol cartridges. Uh, we see the cytosol filter uh, using polymer beads, uh, which is able to absorb the hydrophobic molecules but not LPS. And we don't have, for the moment, any uh, randomized clinical trials on septic patients. The only one available concerns the cardiosurgical patients with the post-op uh, inflammation enrolling 37 patients. The primary uh, endpoint was the difference in cytokine levels and they found uh, the absence of any uh, difference between uh, the treated group and the conventional one in terms of pro-inflammatory response and in terms of uh, perioperative course. So the last one is the auxiliary filter which is a combination of the two previous methods having properties to remove LPS as well as uh, cytokines, but there is no uh, uh, human data currently available. So in conclusion, we can say that while blood purification in sepsis is a valid approach, the potential efficacy of uh, these methods using extracorporeal membrane has to be evaluated only with positive randomized clinical trials and this could be perhaps achieved in the future with a very careful patient selections based on the adequate biomarkers and having a device target which may help to become a useful therapy in the close future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So I have to, to close the session now. I think it was a very interesting session. I hope you all enjoyed it very much. Please um, visit our website, World Sepsis Day, Instagram, World Sepsis, Facebook, and engage with us on the fight against sepsis. And I really want to thank again all the sponsors of the World Sepsis Congress uh, who made available um, this very exciting Congress and the very exciting talk. So um, we are very thankful. And yeah, I thank you very much for joining the session, for having a very interesting discussion, and uh, goodbye to the next session.